Government House Leader. Sorry, I'm stuck. Uh, G171. Order G171, resuming the debate adjourned on February 24th, 2020, on the motion for second reading of Bill 171, an act to enact the Building Transit Faster Act 2020, and make related amendments to other acts. Further debate. I recognize the member for Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, I rise to speak to this bill, Bill 171. As you might well guess, Speaker, this bill is contentious in my writing, as is the Ontario line itself. The Ontario line is contentious not because people don't want transit. They desperately want and need transit. It's contentious because bad design and bad consultation leave pe people fearful that their lives will be unnecessarily upended. For years, my constituents have been pressing for transit investment. People in my riding find that they can't get on the streetcar in the morning. When they get on, they're packed in like sardines and they can't get on the streetcar to come home at the end of the day. People go to pay subway station to get on the subway to go to work and find that they have to wait multiple trains before they can actually get on the subway train and get to work. And so when I go door to door talking to people about transit, it comes up constantly. When will something be done so that I can actually get to work in a timely way. How can that happen? And frankly, Speaker, a number of years ago when the City of Toronto came forward with its proposal for a relief line and held public meetings in my riding about the design of that relief line, there was a huge amount of optimism. It was not an easy process. The City actually consulted at length, held a number of public meetings, listen to the concerns and critiques of the people in my community and ultimately settled it out. Meetings were quite rowdy. The direction of or the route of that line was changed in the course of those consultations as practical issues were pointed out by the community and in the end accepted and turned into reality by the City of Toronto. People knew that there would be disruption because we knew where the excavation Holes were going to be put for the tunnel boring machines. Pape Avenue would have been shut down for an extended period or greatly restricted, and people's homes would be expropriated. In fact, people got expropriation notices. People were not happy about having their lives disrupted. Who is? But they were happy that finally something was going to move forward and they'd be able to get to work. And I want to point this out because I know there are some people who say, you don't like the Ontario line because you have a not-in-my-backyard approach. This is a community speaker that has supported a major construction project going through it to deal with transit issues. But they do object to bad design and poor treatment through missing consultation with the community. Before I talk about this bill, the content of the bill and its associated regs, regulations. I want to note some of the concrete problems that people in this community, my community, face because of poor design and poor consultation. In the south end of my riding, the Ontario line will come above ground for about two kilometres through a residential area. This area has homes built in the late 1800s, so homes are very close to the existing rail lines. That's just the way things were done. And when people moved in, they knew that there were rail lines. They understood that. But we have an issue now with noise from trains, which people live with. If you're in my riding at rush hour and the trains are going by, you have to stop speaking. Trains go by every seven and a half to 10 minutes. The GO system is being upgraded so trains can be more frequent, and people in my community support that. They need the necessary modifications, the safety barriers, the noise barriers, but they understand the need for that increase in transit investment. But when you say we're going to have GO trains not every seven and a half to ten minutes, but every three and a half minutes, and subway trains going past at every 45 seconds, it's going to be very difficult to hold a conversation outside. And I have to say to all of you, we've been through the consultations with Metrolinx on sound barriers. Substantial questions have not been addressed, 
and the community is deeply frustrated that they can't get answers to their questions about where sound barriers will go and how they will be upgraded in response to the concerns of the community. That is a substantial concern for people. How will you actually have a conversation outside? Jimmy Simpson Rec Centre, which is the major rec centre in the southwest quadrant of my riding, is at risk because you have to widen the railway right of way. It's possible that the centre will have to be taken down. In any event, you may well have trains immediately beside the west wall of that centre changing the experience people are going to have inside. Font Bon Ministries, it's a home for women who've had difficulty getting housing, they're fragile, they're seniors. With the widening of the right-of-way, you may well have trains right up against the sidewall of that ministry. Sisters of St. Joseph talked to me about the need to protect the women who live there and their homes. Pape Avenue School, just about the point where this train is going to come above ground, we don't yet know the impact there. Will there have to be an impact on the schoolyard, on the school itself? When I ask Metrolink staff about this, in all three cases they say, we don't think we're going to have to do anything there, we think they're safe. I ask, can you give me a guarantee? Show me the document where these three places are protected and I can't get that. Along the side of the railway lines, in a number of spots, are the park space that we have in that part of town, in an area that's parks deficient already. It's clear if you expand the railway right of way, we're going to have much smaller or no parks in that area. And in the north end of my riding, people felt that the process where they woke up one day, read the newspaper, and found out there was a subway train going through their street and that they may be expropriated was not an appropriate way to let people know that their lives were going to change. When the City of Toronto was doing its Relief Line North consultations, they had public meetings, they showed people a variety of routes, there was discussion, people had some sense, okay, this may be coming. But all of that was cancelled and simply people got a line on a map and noticed their lives were about to change. That is not good public management. That is not good consultation. Um, the Premier has said, or the Premier's ministers have said, they need to build the Ontario line above ground through two kilometres of my riding in order to save money. It's expensive going underground, and I don't argue that for a minute, Speaker. It is. But expense was certainly not on the Premier's mind when he announced in April 2019 that the Eglinton West LRT extension would be built, quote unquote, underground where it belongs. Now, we're talking about a four lane highway going through Etobicoke Centre, and if you look at Google Earth, you can see the industrial plazas, the shopping plazas. We're not talking about putting uh, a large LRT right beside a residential area or through a residential area. You're going through a highway, but he felt it was important to put that underground. The business case for the Eglinton West extension, the LRT, was prepared by the city in 2016. The city looked at a variety of options. The least cost option was the LRT above ground down the middle of that, that road. They calculated on present value of costs, it would be $3.4 billion. What the Premier opted for was calculated at $4.7 billion. So if there's a shortage of money, Speaker, I've got to ask, what's the Premier thinking? If he wants a light rail transit system built underground through the riding where he lives and above ground in a riding that he doesn't hold, if we're in a situation when it comes to a riding that he doesn't hold where unfortunately there was no money, we went to the piggy bank. Too bad, so sad, you're going to have a very noisy life. Speaker, I can't describe in parliamentary language what kind of approach this is, but you, Speaker, may be able to think it through and come to your own conclusions. The Minister has told us that we need this Act to get transit built. And I just want to note very brief, briefly a history of Conservative approach to building transit. In 1995, when the Harris government was elected, the province and the city were building the Eglinton subway system. What happened 
25 years ago to that subway that we aren't able to take right now? Well, it was stopped, and the tunnels were filled in with concrete. So people say, why can't we build transit in Toronto? Well, I'll tell you why. Sometimes you get governments elected that decide to fill in subway tunnels with concrete. That system would be operating today if it had not been stopped then. 2010, the election of the Ford administration in Toronto. At the point of that election, a $6 billion project of light rail transit had been agreed for, let me get it right, Eglinton, Finch, Shepherd, and Scarborough. Cancelled. Rapid transit that would be running today if it had not been cancelled. That is the record of a premier who did what he could to make sure that transit, in fact, didn't happen. So if this government says it wants to speed up transit. First of all, I want it to look at itself and look at its record, but I also want it to note that the relief line had its environmental assessment done, passed, approved, design was well underway, construction was supposed to start this year. And what happened with the relief line? It's been pushed back. So a government said it's in a hurry to get transit in place, look at its history, look at most recent actions, that is not what we see. Now, this government has brought forward this bill and it's brought forward associated regulations, the details, the fine work that allow people to know precisely what legal framework they're working with. There's a really important point here, Speaker, that people need to understand, that environmental issues and their resolutions can be set aside if the Minister of the Environment thinks that those <coughs> issues and the resolution are going to be unduly delaying the project. And that's extraordinary for a Minister of the Environment. And I'll read the summary uh, posted by the government on the environmental registry. The Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks will be able to intervene in the Metrolinx-led issues response process, the response to environmental issues, and to modify any measures proposed by Metrolinx in response to issues and concerns, <coughs> issues and concerns, environmental, health and safety, if the Minister is of the view that the proposed measures could delay the timely delivery of these projects. In other words, Speaker, the environment, health and safety are not the top issue for the Minister of the Environment. He has permission to set those aside if it slows down this project. That is extraordinary. People need to let that sink in. The message for the Minister of the Environment is not protect the local environment, protect health and safety of residents near the transit line, but <coughs> explicitly he has or she has the power to block measures that could delay timely delivery of these projects. So, if Metrolinx identifies an environmental problem in the course of its study and provides a solution to protect human health and safety, that solution can be blocked by the Minister of the Environment if he or she thinks it can slow down the project. That's extraordinary. That is an extraordinary rewrite of the responsibilities of the Minister of the Environment. So I think the Minister needs a new title. Uh, the Minister of Rubber Stamp Approvals, the, the Minister of um, Expediting Projects and Setting Aside Concerns, the Minister of Go to Sleep Now, Little Baby, Don't You Cry, Everything's Fine. Um, I think it's amazing that this would be put forward by any government, frankly. Um, I also want to talk about the fact that this project is being set up, the environmental assessment is being set up so you can have early works and later works so that you can get an approval for some early works and then you can start this project without having done a full environmental review of the impacts of this project. Speaker, first of all, this is an $11 billion project. If you are proceeding with an $11 billion project and you've made a mistake in the first stage and only caught it later on, then you're going to be stuck with some very expensive redoing. When I spoke about this last week, I talked about 
a saying that carpenters have, which is measure twice and cut once. And you know what, Speaker? It's an amazing thing. That actually makes a lot of sense. And what's being put in place here is a system where you can cut as much as you want and you figure it out later and you might have to glue it all back together in, if you can. Some might say, okay, well, the early works, we're just talking minor stuff, right? Things that won't have a big impact on people's lives or the cost of this project. But I want to read the definition of early works because, you know, they're actually fairly substantial. Early works means any components of the Ontario Line project that Metrolinx proposes to proceed with before the completion of the Ontario Line assessment process. You know, that environmental assessment process, mm, rubber stampy sort of thing. Um, so components such as station construction, rail corridor expansion, utility relocation, or bridge replacement or expansion. We're talking early works. We're talking some pretty big projects. In fact, it leads to the question, well, what's left once you've done all that? Um, so what happens if this early work poses problems when you do the environmental assessment later for the project as a whole? Are we going to have a minister who's been told, get it done and get it done now, say, oh no, we have to stop for a minute, we have to correct the errors we made, fix things so the environmental problems, the health and safety problems are dealt with? Speaker, there is at least one spot on the Union Pearson Express route, and there may be others, where safe sound barriers were promised by Metrolinx and never put in place. Why? Because they had put in place another structure earlier that didn't have the strength to support the sound barrier. Too bad. So sad. I feel badly for the people who are having to put up with noise because, in fact, they messed up on design, and Metrolinx shows no urgency about replacing that structure so you can have the sound barrier that was required in the environmental assessment. Speaker, in many ways, I think what we're seeing is a bill and associated regulations being put together to protect Metrolinx, protect the province, protect the private sector proponent, and not to protect the community and the environment. That is not the way things should be done here in Ontario. That is a major problem. I want to note that my colleague from University of Rosedale, our transit critic, had some interesting things to say about this bill just the other day, and I want to repeat some of what she had to say. I want to respond, and I'm quoting her, I want to respond to the Minister of Transportation's remark, this government is working in partnership with the City of Toronto. Let's be super clear about what that actually means. Yes, the City of Toronto, with a gun to their head, agreed to support these new transit projects on the condition the rest of the transit system was not taken away from the City of Toronto against their consent. <coughs> you know, that's a pretty powerful incentive. I won't take away your subway system if you agree to what I've put forward. You've got a nice store here, Mr. Mayor. Shame if something happened to it. That's the kind of dynamics we're dealing with. We should also put in context the City of Toronto asked for numerous things to be part of negotiations with the government when we move forward with these transit lines. Those requests including keeping maintenance under the city's control and because there is concern at the city about the impact on the above ground section. The city made it very clear they wanted the province to listen to those residents and to work to identify and mitigate some of the concerns around noise and construction. And if those concerns could not be mitigated, then the option to go underground is something that should have moved forward with this. Our critic says, I've met with Ministry of Transportation officials as well as Metrolinx officials, and they've not shown any interest in moving forward on the City of Toronto's requests. I can see my time is limited, but I want to touch on just a few points. The change in the expropri expropriation uh, rules process reduces the ability of citizens to deal with unjust, unfair, or simply erroneous decisions on expropriation. You're going to need expropriation in this situation. You're going to need it with any major project like this. But frankly, to say to citizens, if we made a mistake, tough luck, is not the way to approach it. It undermines people's confidence that, in fact, they're dealing with a fair and reasonable system. Speaker, 
There is much that I had to say, but I want to just quickly address this. The minister says that these powers will just be used as a backstop. I don't believe that's the case. If the government wants to get transit rolling, it needs to rewrite this bill. It needs to move away from privatized construction design, the public-private partnership model that the Auditor General of Ontario has said has cost Ontarians so much money in the many billions. Build real community support, which means real consultation and a willingness to vary design based on what's heard. And it needs to allocate the money. And if it does those things, if it has community support and good design, then this will go ahead quickly. And if it doesn't, it won't. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Questions? Uh, the member for Oakville. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker. I, I personally take the GO train and subway every day to Queen's Park, and I can tell you that the overwhelming majority of commuters that I talk to, and I do talk to them on the GO train and the subway, are supportive of our government's plan uh, with respect to transit. Try taking the subway at peak hours right now. Uh, it's, it's unbelievable. There's absolutely no room. And there's been no major subway expansion in, in decades in Toronto due to government incompetence. All three levels of government have supported our approach to transit. And that, I asked, why is the official opposition not supporting us like the other levels of government from different political parties? This has never happened before in Canada with all three levels of government supporting transit. So my question to the member opposite is, does he not recognize that the Better Transit Faster Act and how important it is for future generations? Thank you. Thank you. The member for Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Um, there are a few points that, that I'd like to address. First off, I support transit expansion. My party supports transit expansion. When you cancelled the Eglinton, when your party cancelled the Eglinton subway back in the 90s, we opposed that. When you cancelled, when the Ford administration, City Hall, cancelled a fully funded program of building LRT, we opposed the Ford administration doing that. So now you're saying, decades later, well, now we care about transit. Well, so do we. But the fact that those projects got killed off, and now you've killed off the relief line, which could be under construction now, it really makes me doubt that you have that great support for transit. If you did, if your government did, it would not have killed off the relief line. That is the, Response. what can I say, the exhibit A of this case. So yes, we need transit. We're going to have to see what can be made out of the Ontario line. Revamp it. Thank you. Deal with the design issues. Thank you. Question, the member for London Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank uh, the member from uh, Toronto, Danforth, for his um, contributions to this debate. And we know that, I mean, transit is an issue throughout Ontario. Uh, even in London, the city of London, there's been challenges around transit. Um, but the member brought up an uh, interesting point about the above ground uh, line that's going to be two kilometres in Toronto, Danforth, as opposed to the line that's going to be underground when he referred to the, uh, the riding of the Premier. And I'd like to know um, what evidence did the government present um, to justify the, uh, other than the, the dollar amount, because our member talked about that there's a discrepancy and it's actually uh, cheaper. Um, what additional evidence does the government provide to justify that um, underground as above to above, above ground in different ridings? Thank you. Thank you. The member for Toronto Danforth. Well, I, I haven't seen any evidence from the government to justify that. Um, all we had from the, the Premier with regard to putting the Eglinton West LRT underground was that this is a busy highway. And it probably is a busy highway. Eglinton is a busy road. Uh, we have busy roads in this city. I've noticed that. But the economics are, and it's $1.4 billion difference, putting an LRT along a main road saves an awful lot of money. Putting a subway above ground down, <laughs> down through a residential area built up against a railway line, I don't think is justifiable. And I haven't heard from the government even the numbers. I can't get the numbers. I've asked, what's the underground cost? What's the above ground cost in the Ontario line? Response. Sorry. Thank you. Minister of Government and Consumer Services. 
Mr. Speaker, I have to join the debate today, excuse me, and ask a question of the member from Toronto Danforth. You know, I heard him during his debate talk about his concern over noise. And through the years, we've agreed to disagree on certain things. But when I heard him today speaking about his concern of noise, I can't help to be a little heartened because I have to ask the member from Toronto Danforth, are you going to exercise that same concern in rural Ontario when it comes to industrial wind turbines and the noise that's created for the people that live within 550 metres of those turbines? A member for Toronto Dan. Yeah. I appreciate the question from the minister. Um, it's a salient question. I think there does need to be a, a, a barrier in, in distance between a windmill and a home. And I would ask that the same criteria be applied to the Ontario line in my riding. At 500 metres, you'd have to go underground. So in my riding, we'd accept 500 metres. We'd accept it today. Offer given, offer taken. Thank you. <laughs> Question the member for London West. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Speaker. I want to uh, thank uh, my colleague, the member for Toronto Danforth, for his remarks. And uh, he ended his uh, his uh, speech with uh, with some very serious cautions about engaging or expanding three P or P3 models of transit building. He mentioned the uh, Auditor General's report, which found uh, that taxpayers are paying significantly more for P3 projects than they would if they were publicly funded. I'm interested in hearing his, his thoughts about uh, the P3 model and whether this is a, a, an appropriate way to, uh, to proceed with transit projects in Ontario. Toronto Danforth. Yeah, I, I appreciate the question uh, from my colleague. No, obviously, I don't think it's a good way to proceed. What we're having is a rewrite of environmental assessments to accommodate P3s. That in itself raises huge questions about proceeding with the project before it's completely assessed and, frankly, undermining the ability of the public to intervene and help reshape a project when problems are obvious and the, proponent, the public's, private sector proponent is going to ignore everything that the community has to say. That's one level. The other level is just simply cost. We've looked at the Eglinton Crosstown, which is a P3. P3s were, or these public-private partnerships were billed as taking all the risk out of public hands and putting it in private hands and making sure things got built on time. Response? It's much slower than promised and it's way over budget. Thank you. The member for Flamborough Glanbrook. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, uh, my question, of course, is to the member from Toronto Danforth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the role of the opposition clearly is to oppose policy, legislation, um, that well, it is, uh, that is presented in the legislature. And we've heard that. Uh, members across the aisle have opposed almost every aspect of the Building Transit Faster Act, despite the fact that if you travel anywhere in the city of Toronto, you are forced to deal with increasing congestion. You have opposed this piece of legislation, but like so many other things that we have brought forward, you have not brought any sort of a solution forward. What is your proposal Question. to get transit projects built faster in the City of Toronto? Member for Toronto Danforth. Well, I, I, I appreciate the question from the member. Um, I guess there are a few things. Don't cancel projects that are ready to be built. So the relief line was ready for construction. We'd be under construction now if you hadn't cancelled it. So that's one suggestion. When you've got a shovel-ready project, build it. That isn't what's happened. I think we'd have less congestion if you decided to go ahead with the project that was there, but you didn't. Don't cancel projects like the, uh, the light rail transit that had been proposed and cancelled in 2010 by the Ford administration in the City of Toronto. We would have a whole bunch of transit built and operating. Don't stop subway construction that's already underway and fill the tunnels in with concrete if you think you're in favour of transit. If those two things Response. in 95 and 2010 had not happened, we'd have a lot more transit in the city and much less congestion. So when I have Thank this you. government come and say, 
Oh. Thank you. We have time Speaker. for a very quick question and a very quick answer. Question. Member for London Fanshawe. Um, so I'm going to uh, concise my question. Uh, this government does not have a good track record on public consultation. I want to ask the member, um, what advice would he give the government in order to engage the public better around consultation with this massive transit project that they're proposing? Member for Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, I guess a few things. One, in terms of actually holding meetings, uh, don't just have an open house where you have uh, placards around the room that people can look at and ask a few questions of staff who are there. Have a, a forum where people as a group can ask questions and have those questions answered by politicians and senior staff. That's one thing. Let people know what's going on. I, I know people in my riding had geophysical testing happening on their streets without notice it was going to happen. Suddenly they had these big boring machines up and down their streets asking themselves, well, what's going on here? Thank you, Speaker. Further debate. The member for Richmond Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It gives me great pleasure to speak to the Bill 171, the proposed Building Transit Faster Act, legislation that will help deliver Ontario four priority subway projects on time and on budget. As the MPP for Richmond Hill, I know that my constituents are excited to see the government 